Okay. Good morning, everyone. How are you? It is uh, good morning. It's great to see everyone. It's been a while since we've been in person, so it's really a pleasure to be here and to see familiar faces that we've, we've just been hearing you uh, online the last couple of years. So it's great to see the board. Great to see staff. Thank you everyone for joining us. It is October 26th, Thursday, and this is the California Acupuncture Board. And uh, let's start with uh, roll call. Good morning. John Harabedian. Here. Yang Ping Chen. Here. Robin Asaria. Here. Francisco Kim. Shu Dong Lee. Here. Dr. Amy Mateki. Here. We do have quorum. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'll just do yeah, my, my remarks are going to be brief. It's just going to be, um, I, I am really looking forward to kind of diving in with the help of the board and, and the public here uh, on some of these items today. And then obviously setting the calendar going forward and tackling a lot of the issues that we've been talking about the last few years. And now that we've uh, gotten out of um, a period where a lot of us were forced remote, I think that uh, it's going to be nice to be working together in person again. So, again, I am really happy that so many of you have showed up. Hopefully, we'll we'll get more folks to show up uh, at future meetings in person. But um, but thank you all. Uh, we do have some, and uh, Mr. Bode, I don't know when you want to bring this up, but we did have, I think, a few proposed. Uh, changes to the order of our agenda, and I don't know if you want to kind of just comment on that. And we can see if the board's amenable to it. Certainly, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, today we have uh, two items that uh, I am requesting be moved up in the agenda to be taken out of order from the agenda that was printed. Our uh, supervising deputy attorney general liaison is here with us today, Keith Shaw, and he'll be uh, guiding the board through a closed session item as well as. Uh, here to address any questions regarding a uh, possible uh, interface between our disciplinary guidelines and the DOJ. Uh, and so I'm requesting that both uh, agenda items uh, 10, the closed session, as well as agenda item uh, 9, the disciplinary guidelines and uniform standards related substance abusing licensees be moved up such that closed session is first and then uh, the disciplinary guidelines after that. The closed session will require that everybody leave the room for this time that the item is being discussed, aside from the board members, legal counsel, and any other appropriate staff. Would the board be amenable to that? I have no problem with that. So just, just to be clear, we're going to move up closed session. Um, so item number 10, where exactly do you want it? Uh, it'll be the next item. Okay. So before we do minutes? Correct. Okay. Uh, what, I, I'll entertain any comments, feedback, or, or emotion from the board. If we're okay with that, someone could just move and and I'll ask for a second. Legal counsel, is it required that we have a motion here? No. Okay. Formally? Yeah. Uh, if we won't do a formal motion then, is, is there any objection to that? Does anyone have a problem with doing closed session right now? I think I think for efficiency and because we do have legal counsel here, it's really sort of a must. So uh, let's just go ahead and do that. I'm not hearing any protests. So, okay, let's okay. do that. And for members of the public, what we're going to just to summarize, we're going to go into closed session really quickly uh, to take care of the item. Uh, and then we're going to be back in front of you uh, shortly to do the rest of the agenda. Uh, <laughs> The public is going to be asked to leave. Is that that is correct? I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, but this shouldn't be too long. So thank you very much. We will now go to item number 10 uh, as our next item. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, we're back in open session and uh, we had just done item number 10 closed session and uh, legal counselors anything you'd like to say uh, nothing uh, no need to report out on anything on that so we can move on to the next item thank great you. thank you we will move on to item number three 
uh, which is review and possible approval of board meeting minutes for the April 7th, 2023 meeting. Did we do the nine? Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, any questions on the minutes? If not, I will entertain a motion. We have the April 2023 minutes that we're reviewing at the moment. Uh, just to distinguish it from the June 2023 minutes. Is there a motion or any questions from the board members? I can move for to approval. The April. Okay. We have a motion for approval. Do we have a second? Okay, so Mateki move. Uh, Young Ping Chen for the second. I will now open it up for public comment. It's the minutes, item number three. Neil Miller from Cal Atma. Uh, I've brought this up before. I'll bring it up again. Uh, it would be beneficial that the board writes down, especially if someone comes up here and says, I am like Neil Miller from Cal Atma, and that the minutes reflect who said what. If it just says public member, um, it, it doesn't give a real um, good picture. And so you have four or five different co comments from, from public members and Nobody can read the minutes, has any idea where it's coming from or how anybody in the profession can follow up. So if somebody came up here and made a great point and said, oh, I agree with you. Or if the board had a question and somebody responded in terms of a public comment, then there's a, a follow up. So I, I brought it up before and I hope you guys could see it that in the future, yeah, there won't be too much work if we come up and we announce who we are and then you put the name of who it was. If you don't understand their name or you can say public public member came up here. But if it's a practitioner or somebody who's representing some organization, I think that it's it's uh, beneficial. I don't see a downside to it. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll bring it back. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Oh, yeah. Any comments, proposed comment from the online audience? This is the moderator. The instructions are on the screen for those who are logged in. If you would like to participate, click on the hand outline, which is typically at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. Or you can open up the panelist list by clicking on the participants button, typically right corner of your WebEx screen, and hovering the cursor over your mouse, oops, over your name, sorry, until you find the outline of a hand and you click on that, that'll raise your hand. If you are calling in, it's star three to raise your virtual hand. Great. At this time, I see no requests. Great. Thank you very much. We'll bring it back to the board for a vote. Um, Ms. Brodea, are you going to be doing the roll call or, uh, or is it? Madam Brothers. Ms. Brothers. So John Harabedian? Yes. Young Ping Chen? Ruben Osorio? Yes. Francisco Kim? Yes. Shu Dong Lee? Yes. Dr. Amy Mateki? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, and we will move on to item number four quickly, the June 2023 20, minutes. Same, same question. Any, any question or change? If not, I will entertain a motion for approval. You, you want to move, Ruben? Okay. Mr. Osorio makes the motion. Do I have a second? Okay. Mr. Kim seconds, and we will open this up for public comment. I assume Mr. Miller's comment will be dittoed on this, which is to, in public comment, have the name of the public member. Any other public comments? Go ahead. Neil Miller from Cal Atma. So at the end of each of these, there's a place where it has a public comment for future agenda items. Yep. And as you know, I've made a number of those over the years and they never seem to make it to the next meeting. Is there an appropriate way to follow up? Like I could look at today's minutes and say, and the last two meetings and say, okay, 
here's the same things. Here's the same things. Can we send that to Ben and we'll get to you? Or how do we go about uh, um, prioritizing things that people came up with? Even Francisco Kim had some good ideas for future agenda items. And we've still gone three or four meetings and none of them have made it to the agenda. So I'm trying to make it how, how I can help make it more efficient so that the items that whether the public has it or public members or board members, license, licensees, would be able to get those ideas out so that the board yep. would be more efficient moving forward with some of those good ideas that we're coming up with. Appreciate the question. Uh, we, we will respond to that at that item. So thank you. And I'll wait for the moderator to see if we have any online comments. This is the moderator. The instructions are on the screen for your reference. If you're logged in and would like to participate, click the hand outline, or if you're calling in star three to raise your virtual hand. No requests at this moment. Thank you. We'll come back for a roll. John Herbedian? Yes. Yang Ping Chen? Ruben Asario? Yes. Francisco Kim? Yes. Chu Dong Lee? Yes. Dr. Amy Mateki? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you again for the comment. We will move now to item number nine as discussed the disciplinary guidelines. And I believe we're going to be hearing from uh, Mrs. Brothers. Good morning, board members. Um, so, um, you guys have seen this in the past, uh, our disciplinary guidelines and uniform standards related to substance abusing licensees. Um, this is a big lift, so it's just kind of a nature of the beast, um, bringing it back to the board anytime there are, um, little changes and things like that. Um, there were actually quite a bit of changes since last time you all reviewed this. So I'm just going to get a little bit into the background of the memo, um, but I'm not going to go over the specifics of each change. Um, so this package incorporates three different bills, uh, SB 1441, which is the actual uniform standards related to substance abusing licensees, SB 1448, um, which is a mandatory probation status disclosure, and then AB 2138 um, that deals with denial of applications um, and criminal convictions. So the board last reviewed the proposed language to update its disciplinary guidelines and implement the uniform standards at its December 2020 public meeting. And at that time, the changes were minimal. Uh, we just incorporated um, substantial relationship criteria and criteria of rehabilitation uh, to the guidelines off of AB 2138. Since then, staff has been developing the draft rulemaking documents, and we did submit that to DCA's regulatory unit for review in June 2021. Uh, the reg unit suggested um, numerous edits to the disciplinary guidelines, lots of improvements um, to the document as a whole. And so we're bringing those revisions. Um, and please note that the last complete legal review of the rulemaking um, was with prior legal counsel. So the amendments to update the disciplinary guidelines and implement the uniform standards have uh, changed since the December 2020 meeting. Existing amendments to the proposed language establish a presumption that the licensee is a substance abusing licensee if the conduct found to be grounds for discipline involves drugs and or alcohol. This would give notice to the licensee that they have the burden of rebutting that presumption. And we did hear from the Office of the Attorney General um, explaining a lot of the benefits of going this route, um, that it uh, provides, or sorry, includes consistency with protection of the public, it's less costly and more expedient, and it provides more discretion after the accusation is filed, bringing a flexibility to impose appropriate discipline in the event that sufficient evidence, uh, mitigating evidence is provided by the licensee. We also, um, in the language, are incorporating the quarterly report form. It's a new subsection E, um, and we made some minor edits for clarity and accurate citation reference to the other areas of the proposed language. And all of the changes you'll see um, are in yellow highlight. Um, 
The quarterly report form is uh, used by our uh, enforcement staff for licensees that are placed on probation. Um, and so it was necessary being that the guidelines require uh, the licensees on probation to use the quarterly report that we incorporate that into regulation. And so you can see that it's like the last document following the disciplinary guidelines. Um, so many of the edits to the entire document, um, there's lots of them, but they provide clarity, they remove redundancy or errors, and they improve the document as a whole. Uh, we also had some grammatical edits, updates, and changes to any gender specific pronouns throughout the document. Um, and again, I'm not gonna read through the specifics of each change to each page, but you'll see that there are basically changes to every single page um, of the disciplinary guidelines. And then we have um, also the proposed text for review following this memo. And also on the last page of the memo, uh, you'll find a recommended motion to approve the language. And part of the motion, you would have to uh, rescind the board's prior uh, December 2020 adoption. Um, so let me know if there are any comments or questions. Thank you for that. Um, and it, look, the to kind of this to summarize in the upshot is there there are a lot of changes here. Most of them, um, as Christine said, really is clean up, making it read better, clarifying certain things, changing titles. Uh, there is, I think, one sort of substantive um, clarification in terms of the presumption for substance abuse um, for licensees. And I think to the extent that there are questions about that from the board, we we might want to just ask them now. We we have talked about this over the years and and came to a conclusion to go this direction uh, where the rebuttable presumption is back on the licensee if they have been disciplined for any sort of substance abuse. Um, and I think that is the right way of doing it. But other than that, um, a lot of this is changing, you know, must to may and changing titles and and clarifying certain things in terms and conditions and, and the stipulated settlement and things of that nature. So for the benefit of the public here and online, a lot of changes, a lot of highlighted language, but uh, most of it is not material. Um, so are there any questions? And if not, that's fine. Um, we will. How about we open? Uh, well, you wanted a motion for approval of the of the amendments, so I can I can wait for a motion before I open it up to public comment. But um, if we don't have any questions, we I can entertain a motion from a member to approve uh, the changes to the disciplinary guidelines. And I think there is model language, uh, as Mr. Brothers did say, and that is on page ten of ten. So someone did want to move. There's language here on the last page. Sorry, I'd like to move. Is your microphone on? I'd like to make a motion. So just read this. <laughs> uh, we send the board's December 2020 order to initiate uh, rulemaking for this proposal relating to Article 6.1. Point six point six point one six point two in the section thirteen ninety nine point four six nine of the California Code of Regulations CCR Title sixteen and the approved new Article six point one six point two and the newly proposed reg regulatory text for section thirteen ninety nine point four six nine, including the incorporated disciplinary guideline and guidelines and the quarterly report presented at this meeting. The board authorizes initiation and the possible adoption of new text as follows. More? <laughs> uh. 
direct staff to submit the text to the director of the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Business Consumer Services and the Housing Agency for review and if no adverse comments are received, authorize the executive officer to take all steps necessary to initiate the rulemaking request uh, process, rulemaking process. Make any non-substantive substantive changes to the package and set the matter for a hearing if requested. If no adverse comments are received during the 45-day comment period and uh, no hearing is requested, authorize the executive officer and the board staff to take all steps necessary to complete the rulemaking and amend section 1399.469 and adopt the new article 6.1 and 6.2 of division 13.7 of title 16 of CCR as noticed. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Thank you. <laughs> Good uh, practice. No, I appreciate that. I do. Is there is there a second? I second that. Okay. Uh, let's open this up for public comment. Neil Miller from Cal Atma. Um, does the board have a um, process or a plan, or is this part of strategic plan on how to get the word out about this? Uh, we're trying to be proactive. We're trying to be proactive about all these different things. We really need to get the word out there. Is there a way that the associations can help? Is there? Do you have a plan with which to get it out there? Because if you just have a few people here showing up and very few people online, we're going to still have same disciplinary problems. Uh, it's potential to have disciplinary problems, and I think the, most of the disciplinary, disciplinary problems, especially with small little rules that we're not aware of, that we need to make the, the profession aware of so that we can better protect the public. So I'd like to put it out there that you guys come up with a plan on, on which how to get the word out there. Thank you, Mr. Miller. We'll, we'll come back and address that. Any other comments? Madam moderator, any comments online? This is the moderator. The instructions are on the screen. For those who are logged in and would like to participate, click on the outline of a hand. And those who are calling in, press star three to raise your virtual hand. At this time, I see no requests. Thank you very much. We'll bring it back for a roll call. John Harabedian? Yes. Yang Ping Chen? Yes. Ruben Osorio? Yes. Francisco Kim? Yes. Chu Dong Lee? Yes. Dr. Amy Mateki? Yes. The motion um, is approved. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the hard work, um, Christine, and all staff on that and uh, the board for. Yeah, years of work. That was that was a lot. Uh, let, let let's actually just take a second to address Mr. Miller's uh, question of how how do we what is our process of of educating the public on these new disciplinary guidelines? We definitely will be posting an update on our website under the what's new section uh, for recently approved regulations. We'll be sending out uh, notifications to all our listserv uh, recipients, so the mailing list that people have voluntarily signed up for. And for new regs, we'll also be sending this out to our licensee lists. Now, the licensee list isn't comprehensive in that licensees aren't required to provide an email, but the new licensing system does mandate an email to log on. So we're getting more and more of our licensees on that as well, uh, and then looking to do um, a notification by mail as well to the licensee's address of record. Keep them updated. Thank you for that. Um, so that was item number nine, and we will now go to uh, item number five, the executive management report. Thank you. 
Thank you. We'll start with the budget report, and we have, uh, I believe, Sarah Hinkle on the line, our budget uh, analyst at, with the Department of Consumer Affairs. Yes, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Sarah Hinkle, and I want to thank the board and the executive staff for allowing me a few minutes to present on agenda item B, uh, 5B, the board's expenditure projections and the fund condition statement. And first, I'm going to uh, start with the board's uh, expenditures. Now, these projections that are based on an on actual data through fiscal month 13. This report includes 2021-2022 actual expenditure in green compared to 22-23 budgeted and projected expenditures in blue. And over this two-year period, costs are re relatively similar. Um, as we move down to the end of the document, you'll see the board had a big base budget of approximately 4 million and spent approximately 3.2 million, creating a reversion to the board's fund of uh, 800,000. <clears> and now the following page uh, is the board's fund conditions, I'm sorry, fund condition statement. And as a reminder, we, we read this document uh, from top to bottom and then left to right. So the left column is the board's prior year 22-23 actuals. It shows the board began 22-23 with a beginning balance of just over 3.4 million, uh, collected 4.2 million in revenues with 702,000 from initial license fees, just over 3 million from license renewals, and 433,000 was collected from the issuance of citations, fines, delinquent fees and other revenue. The board expended 3.5 million, which includes 434,000 indirect draws to the fund for statewide pro rata and pension payments. And the board closed 22-23 with just over 4.1 million reserve balance or about 11.9 months in reserves. Now for 20, for current, uh, I'm sorry, for 20, current year 23-24, the board projects revenues of 3.8 million with 675,000 uh, projected from initial license fees and 2.8 million from renewal fees and 332,000 from the issuance of citations, fines, delinquent fees, and um, other revenue. The board's 2023-24 expenditures are based on the Budget Act at nearly 4.2 million between authorized expenditures and direct draws to them, leaving the board with a fund balance of just over 3.7 million or 10.5 months uh, in reserve. The budget office will continue to monitor the board's revenues and expenditures and report back to the board with the expenditure projections as we continue to close fiscal months in the current fiscal year. Now, a few things to note of the board's fund condition. This fund condition is a snapshot in time, and one of the main factors driving the expenditure increases in future years as a result of personal service adjustments, and these include general salary increases, as well as employee compensation and retirement rate adjustments. But office includes a conservative ongoing 3% increase to expenditures on the fund condition statement to account for these ongoing incremental adjustments. And as you may notice, the fund balance is declining over the next three years. Uh, the fund balance reserve is the amount of funds remain at the end of any given fiscal year. And the board's fund has a statutory fund balance limit of 24 months, but typically three to six months is considered sufficient. And then last, I'd like to note to the that any future legislation or anticipated event could result in the board's need for additional resources, which will create costs on, on the fund. At this time, the uh, budget office has no concerns. The board has done an excellent job of being fiscally responsible with its budget, and we'll, we'll continue to monitor the board's fund and provide updates to the board on a regular basis. That concludes my presentation. Again, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present today's meeting, um, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Madam Hingle. Board members, any questions? I'm just glad to hear the board, uh, 
has done a good job. <laughs> Come a long way, indeed. So the part, okay, thank you. You guys hear me okay? Yeah, so the part I see the total revenue transfer, so you can see it's a decline. So what's the reason it's a continued decline? Um, in looking at the total revenues, transfers, and other adjustments from actual to uh, budget year plus two, it's hovering. I mean, it is declining from the 4.2 from the 22-23 year, but it's hovering. We're projecting a stable period uh, after that. Like it, it doesn't waver from 3,800 revenue for the next few years in terms of projections. We'll have to see. The uh, economy is quite volatile right now. so. Just uh, more of a monitoring situation there. Did the renewal fees go down because we reduced fees? Because there is a drop there in 23 to 23, 24. And I know that part of us reducing fees um, had to do with our fund balance and a lot of other things. So does that, or is that just a drop because we have less renewals? It's more of a projected for less renewals. We are the, the we didn't have many people testing and then applying in the last few years. So that again might change again. So um, these are just based on what we've seen so far and projecting based on that. Um, so it, it wasn't from any massive change other than people not taking the exam as uh, readily as they were before the pandemic. I have another question just on the report on the first page. Uh, when I'm glad Sarah was mentioning about it, the green column means and the blue column means, could we put the year there on the top? Or is it that's how the wheels would work? So, you know, Madam Hinkle, uh, for the green and blue columns, uh, the blue is for the current fiscal year, correct? Um, okay, so the, this is for last fiscal year, 22 23. Last so yeah, so the green column, it would be 21, 22. Oh. And then the blue is 22, 23. Thank you. Any further questions from the board? Mr. President, uh, would you like me to continue moving through the executive reports yeah, before we'll public continue comments? through each report and then we'll open up for one public comment at the end. Thank you. Certainly. And apologies, members, I did uh, skip over item A, which is the strategic plan update, uh, which was uh, really to just let the public know that we are meeting tomorrow in this building to address the board's strategic plan. Uh, we have uh, received the environmental survey. Thank you to all of our stakeholders that participated in that. Uh, we even got turnouts from schools as well as students. So that's a really good benefit to have such a wide range of voices uh, to participate in our strategic plan. And I'm um, excited to work with each of you to establish the board's goals for the next five years. Thank you. Any questions regarding that? All right, then let's go to Mr. Hurt for the licensing report. Got a face of music today. There you are, here we are all. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, presenting the um, quarter four 2022-2003 um, licensing report. And then we'll follow with uh, Q1 of 2023-24. Um, um, so you're going to get two reports this one. This is finishing off the year. And if you look at this whole report, I, and then people who are listening online, I would say pull up your board me meeting materials. Um, it's easier to follow these numbers if you're looking at kind of the, the, the numbers rather than just hearing me like, say, 10,000, 5,000, 4,000, whatever I'm going to say with it. So. So to start with, um, in Q4, um, which is April through June of 2023, um, we had um, active licensees. We had 7,462 um, inactive, which means that their license is current, but they can't, they're not allowed to practice and they don't have to be complete CE compliance. We had 2,383. Delinquent licenses were um, 1,805. And... Um, um, the total number of clear active licenses, which would include, um, well, there, there, 
their licenses that can be renewed, which would include all those um, categories, the active, inactive, and delinquent is 11,650. Um, and then a canceled license um, in Q4, we had 91 licensees canceled. So then moving on to our exam statistics or our, um, our new licensing data, which is recently um, licensed acupuncturists. Um, in Q4, we had um, uh, 93 applications received. Uh, of those applications, none were denied. Um, so we had uh, 93 new licenses created in that quarter four. Uh, <clears throat> the number of license, um, acupuncture license renewal in um, Q4 was 468. And then the total number of active wall licenses we had in Q4 was 4,175. And then initial wall licenses um, granted in Q4, which is people, you know, getting a wall license for the first time was 415. And then wall license renewals are 373. So we're starting to see renewals on wall licenses now. And, um, and we will be doing some outreach on that just to get people aware of that this is a requirement that they need to keep uh, going um, now. So then moving on to the continuing ed education report for Q4 of um, 2223. New CE provider um, applications that were approved in Q4 were 10. Uh, we received 850 uh, course applications. And then um, of those applications, uh, there was um, 910 approved. Now these numbers are kind of new, interesting numbers is, um, I just would advise when we're looking at received, that's the amount of applications going across our analyst desks. Um, but when people apply for CE, um, when they're getting a year approval, they can choose to have it um, start um, in any time within a year, right? So, so these are a little bit out of phase. So the, um, the received are what our analysts are working in a, and, and working on at that point. The um, approved are the ones where they're actually available in the, during the calendar year um, coming up. So they'll kind of be, those numbers will be a little bit off that way because they're a little out of phase. We typically have really, really a lot of approvals at the end of the year just because of the way the new system went and with our distance education, everybody needed to reapply. So they're kind of all on a similar renewal cycle on that. Um, course denials, we had five. Um, total active uh, CE providers in Q4 was 246. And then the uh, total uh, provider numbers issued to date since CEs were started with 1,786. So um, as for um, our education, um, uh, and training programs uh, statistics for Q4. Our applications of board approval of curriculum, um, we received two in Q4, um, and um, none were, in, were considered incomplete, and one has been approved during that period of time. So we had one new application approved. For our tutorial training program, um, applications received in Q4 was, was two. We had uh, four new program approvals, um, one program completed during Q4, and currently we're running uh, a total of 50 active uh, tutorial programs. So then moving on to um, 23-24 Q1 data, we're just gonna kind of run through the same data before, but just on this next quarter. So, I mean, you have five quarters of data to look at, so it's, it's useful for, for people tracking the stats at home. Um, so um, our active licensees in Q1, July through September 2023 was um, 7,533. Uh, and we had 2,358 active, uh, inactive licensees, 1,778 um, delinquent, and our um, renewable license, clear licenses are uh, 11,669. In Q1 um, of 23-24, um, we had um, 107 licenses canceled. Um, and then now moving on to our um, Applications for new licenses approved, we had 84 approved and zero were denied. Um, and, you know, one reason that we don't have many denials at that time, by the time they've gone through that process, there's been background checks, there's been all the whole exam procedure. So we, we've had them before they apply for licensures. Other boards, they, they have third party um, exams and stuff like that. So they, they might end up with more den denials than us in terms of that process. Um, um, AC license renewals or acupuncture license renewals um, in, in Q1 was 1,229. We had of our active wall licenses, we had 4,365. Initial wall licenses, new wall licenses issued in that Q1 23-24 uh, was 354. 
and then we had 391 well license renewals. Moving on to CEs, um, again, uh, Q1, 2, 3, 2, 4, uh, we had four new provider applications. Um, we had no denied applications. We received 614 um, course applications, and then um, uh, we approved or approved for uh, quarter uh, one of 23-24 uh, with 691 courses. Um, there was uh, two course denials, and then the total number of active CE providers in Q1 was 267, and our total number of providers issued uh, is 1,790. And then now moving on to our um, uh, acupuncture educational and training program. Um, we didn't receive any applications for board approval of curriculum and none were marked incomplete, but applications we've been working on, uh, we were able to approve eight applications, which is, uh, it's reflected a number of schools are updating their, um, their degrees um, because of the ACOM requirement of the naming conventions. And so the, the, we've, we've had a lot of actually uh, curriculum approvals being initiated by the schools themselves. Um, and then no schools lost approval during Q1. For um, um, the final year, um, uh, actually, we'll have to make a correction. I just noticed on these ones, they're, they're listed on the heading there. Um, this one is 22, 23, but they should be 23, 24. The numbers are right. The, the headings are wrong, and so we'll get that corrected. Um, for the uh, tutorial training programs, um, for 23, 24, um, the number of applications received was none. Um, we had five program approvals. Um, and um, we had four programs completed, and then one uh, program uh, was terminated or abandoned, um, and then of our total programs remained at 50 for that. And then finally, moving on to our exam statistics that we have for 1-1-2023 um, to 6 2023 These are our um, latest. We'll have new statistics uh, um, post-January for the last part of the year, but these are our most recent stats. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and summarize the bottom lines of it because it's, um, you know, as people can pick out the individual school's performance and, and um, first time and uh, retakers. So um, our overall pass rate for first time takers uh, overall was um, 79%. And then um, the overall pass rate for um, retakers and new time takers is 70%. So those numbers are performing just where we expect them to be with the overall rate to be around 70% pass. That's kind of how they they um, develop the test. And then just one announcement for the test, uh, just to put this at the board meeting. Um, retakers are now allowed to retake in 120 days rather than the previous 180 days. So they'll be able to be back to the test quicker than that. And that was made possible by um, creating a, a few more test forms. Um, and the lead on that was OPS. And we appreciate their service on that. And that concludes the license report. Thank you. Any questions? Stay here. Board members, any questions? Just to thank you for that, Mr. Uh, one question on the well licenses. So is there a reason why so many active uh, practitioners don't have well licenses? And is that concerning to us? I mean, when you have over 40% of the active licensees not, um, not having a, an active well license, yeah, it's definitely a concern. Um, we plan to do significant outreach on that and move forward with it. Um, if you remember the way the wall lessons came in, they came in um, starting in 1121 and it was in their next renewal cycle. So that was a two year program to go through that. We also had the pandemic and a lot of people stopped. So people are sort of waking up and dealing with that, but we have definitely noticed the lack of compliance with that and we'll be moving forward with outreach. So, yeah, I mean, I think that that's really appropriate that you identified that. Indeed. Uh, while it is encouraging to see those numbers increase, uh, the wall license numbers in the last five quarters have definitely increased. Um, we do want to make sure that our licensees are aware of the law, uh, which they were physically mailed uh, the update for this. But again, as uh, Mr. Hurt noted, it was a rolling forward two year uh, kind of get onto the wagon kind of program. So um, the conclusion of this year will be uh, the full two year period. So really there's no more mm, excuses after this. Uh, we'd be happy to work with the associations to make sure people are updated. And uh, of course that, that, that does include people that uh, don't have an office, uh, but those are smaller numbers than uh, we're seeing here. I think that uh, we would be seeing a higher percentage of people with wall licenses. And I'm happy to say my acupuncturist has a wall license. So yeah. Members. 
Okay. Francisco, did you have a question? No. Okay. Thank you. I'll go ahead and move on to the enforcement report. This is for section 5E, quarter four of 2223. Thank you, Mr. Hurt. Uh, moving through the complaints and convictions and arrests, we received a total of two for unprofessional conduct, one for unlicensed, unregistered, 11 criminal, criminal charges slash convictions, four from applicants, seven from licensees, seven complaints of sexual misconduct, one fraud, two non-jurisdictional, 20 for incompetence and negligence, two for unsafe or unsanitary conditions, two in the other category, and then one for discipline by another state agency. In terms of investigation total, uh, there we have uh, initiated 49, 342 are still pending, and that does include the backlog that uh, we had for the last year and a half with the vacancies in the enforcement unit, uh, which I'm happy to report are being caught up, uh, and then eight were closed for the quarter four. Moving on to the performance measures, we have uh, looking at quarter four. 38 complaints received, 11 complaints, uh, convictions, arrests received with a total of 49. Intake cycle time for quarter four was two days to take the complaint in and acknowledge it. Uh, for performance measure three, investigative cycle time, uh, we have eight investigations that closed with an average cycle time for those at 82 days. So again, that's a sign of us starting to move through that backlog. Um, of the Investigations, up six closed within 90 days, one within 91 to 180, one within uh, half a year to a year. And then the average time frame uh, for the total time to process citations is zero as uh, there was no final citations issued that quarter. Moving on to performance measure four, uh, volume of cases to the AG, we have five. Uh, again, some of the bigger, more challenging cases that have been taken up by uh, the AG here, uh, a number of those fraud items uh, of those closing, we see that cycle time was 1,679. Um, some of the challenges faced is dealing with other countries, uh, government agencies to confirm uh, the veracity of certain documents and also working with the uh, transcript evaluators and identifying challenges there as well. Of the um, Let's see, moving on to AG cases initiated, zero, pending, we have nine, one accusation was filed, total closed after the transmission was five, two revocations, two voluntary surrenders, one was placed on probation. And then the chart below that, uh, of the, as noted with the increased time, those five cases that closed were over the three-year time frame, and hopefully we're getting through the uh, majority hump now of these more challenging cases, and we're going to start seeing those numbers go down. And there were no PC, uh, Penal Code 23's orders issued or interim suspensions issued. Uh, before moving on to quarter one, are there any questions from the board members for quarter four of the previous fiscal year? Hearing none, move on to quarter one, the current fiscal year. 2023 to 2024. We received complaints uh, for one, unsafe or unsanitary conditions, three for fraud, two for non-jurisdictional, 11 for incompetence, one in the other category, five were in the unprofessional conduct category, nine in sexual misconduct, one for unlicensed, unregistered, and 14 for the criminal charges and convictions. Uh, we did change the order of these a little bit. Hopefully this is a bit clearer. Uh, of the criminal charges and convictions received, all, all 14 were on licensees. In terms of investigations, back down to the totals here, 47 uh, was received, 58 were closed, and pending at 333. So again, starting to move through those. Moving on to performance measures. Uh, number one, the volume of convictions and arrests received, as noted, uh, total complaints received was 33, with 14 of those being convictions and arrests. Uh, for a grand total of 47. If you look at performance measure two, intake cycle time, you'll note that the quarter one item and the year to date item is highlighted and as pending, we identified uh, some tabulation uh, challenges in our uh, database and are working with our Office of Information Services to address uh, getting the appropriate numbers. So we hope to have that for you by the next meeting. Uh, performance measure three, investigation cycle times. Uh, we have 58 investigations that closed with the average cycle time of 338. 
Of those, 24 took uh, 90 days or less, six took 90 to 180, six took half a year to a full year, 16 took one to two years, two took two to three years, and then over three was at four. And then again, no final citations were issued uh, in that last quarter, although a number of the cases were complaints were closed. PM cycle time four, cycle time through discipline, uh, Zero cases were sent to the AG's office in the first quarter. Uh, moving further down, uh, one was initiated, seven are pending, one accusation was filed. And again, the highlighted area you see for closed without disciplinary action is being worked on right now as our database and our um, IT experts. In terms of the cases closed, none, so we have zero there and no PC23s or interim suspension orders. And that concludes quarter one of the current fiscal year. Enforcement statistics. Any questions from the board members? Yeah, I have a, a question. Mr. Kim. Mr. Kim. So uh, I see the on, on page three, there's an increased uh, number of uh, per, uh, percentage uh, uh, investigation cases up to 90 days, but uh, uh, well, over 90 days uh, down. Uh, so up to 90 days, uh, these cases were up or almost 40% up. But uh, when I see the details, most of them are in uh, incompetence and negligence or the other minor like uh, unsanitary conditions like, like that. So I, I believe these are not major uh, like, uh, violation or other citation uh, issues, convictions issues. So maybe. Uh, the, maybe we can talk about the uh, in uh, what do you call it uh, the continuing education uh, uh, ethics and uh, that maybe we can uh, include more on the uh, uh, following all these uh, regulations. I think it will it'll, uh, reduce the number of these uh, citation numbers and maybe it can save uh, all other revenues. To investigate and you know uh, process all these cases, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. And again, we're just tracking complaints coming in. Uh, you know, so that can be alarming sometimes to see like a high number of complaints coming in. But uh, as you can see as well, that there are items closed for non-jurisdictional or uh, no error identified. Any other questions? I'll open up to the public, Mr. President. Let's do that. Yes, thank you. We'll open this up public comment. Any in person comments from the public? Uh, Neil Miller from Cal Atma. Boy, that's a lot to keep up with to take notes on and, and come back and do something intelligent. Um, I, I guess the budget overall is doing much better now that we've had an increase in fees and an increase in all those so that you guys are a little bit more solvent, you can breathe a little easier. That's the bottom line to that whole thing. Um, there was uh, course denials. I kind of want to put that word out. Like, what's a course being denied for? And if we could get a little bit more detail going forward, like, Courses are denied, and then we could give you a list, or maybe moving forward to prevent courses from being denied, or why so many were can't, you know, licensees were canceled. You know, just to get um, 107 cancellations, uh, just to know why. Um, the uh, the uh, wall license, um, a as Mr. Harbidian pointed out, there's just such a low number of turnout and I've asked a couple times and I, I was hoping that we would get some kind of feedback or statistics as to is this $50 wall license more than costing us $50 to put a license on a wall helping the board achieve the purpose for which you the purpose for which they added this fee to us I mean is it is it a useless fee after two years three years have the numbers changed is there anything different or is it just we're just going to keep paying the $50 because if we if statistics would show that nothing's changed then it, and I said this in the beginning I don't think it's going to achieve 
what you're trying to achieve. And I'd like to know, is it or is it not um, a, a achieving the, the goal? And someone has to keep um, the whole process accountable. Otherwise, we're just paying this $50 and there's no accountability as to whether or not the whole idea uh, uh, is working. And uh, when it comes to uh, how, how many pending cases, just to the average person I'm looking at, it, I'm going, that still seems like a whole lot of pending cases. And I know that we've, we're doing better than we have done, like when Ben first came here, but it's still an absorbent amount of, of pending cases. And also I'd like to get some, a little bit of direction on um, what constitutes uh, incompetence or negligence or some of the things that are happening at the offices where you, there was an inspection, there was a complaint. So, because I want to get on, we as an association want to get on the forefront of being proactive, uh, of being proactive to prevent these things so that we can. Um, just a second, maybe just wait. Just so. We, we as an association, okay, go ahead. We as an association simply want to do a better job at, at, at making your job easier by being on the proactive side of preventing these things. I've been talking about it for years and years and years. Ben has done a great job, but I still want to, um, in, in a friendly way, keep your feet to the fire in terms of accountability and getting the information to, to a representative or how do we get it out to the people? Because there's a lot of people who have no idea that you need to have a bell or some way of contacting. I know someone who got fined because they didn't have a, a, a buzzer or a bell for someone to be contacted. So those are the kinds of things that we'd like to get some feedback from the board on what are these cases and, and so we have an idea to highlight it and then how do we get that word out, both from you or from us. Hi, good morning, everyone. Jack Murmarka, Academic Dean and Post College. First of all, I wanted to thank everyone to be here in person. So it's a great feeling to be back after four years. So thank you all. And thank you for keeping basically this board pretty solid over this great pandemic. So a clarification. And, and it, you know, I do teach the laws and ethics. And by the way, the wall license is very clearly covered in our laws and ethics class jobs and like regulations so that all the students are aware of it however some of the older practitioners somehow it must have slipped through and they you know with a pandemic it just maybe they need a reminder the one very important uh, area that's of concern to me which is in some way uh, a personal area is i know for a fact that you mentioned the x number of delinquent licensees and then the ones that were canceled now, I know for a fact that one of those delinquent licenses, one of my colleague, his license number is 511, he's deceased. And yet his relative did not inform the board of his being passed because he doesn't have many relatives around. So they didn't send the death certificate. And from my understanding, there's very few, very, very few over the last, you know, 45 years that I've been licensed here that have sent the death certificate. So if you check Dr. Such and Such, it will show canceled. That is extremely sad and delinquents even more insulting. I think we need to have a mechanism in place where these deceased individuals, and unfortunately they're coming up every, every year, more and more of the older generation is passing. They are now delinquent and they will be canceled. So those numbers went, uh, John Arbinian said, you know, how come we're having so many, you know, canceled or delinquent? I think a, quite a number of them, I know for a fact, are deceased. So we need to do something. I don't know how we can assure that um, the state or you have a way of finding out if this uh, individual, you know, passed in state or out of state or even out of the country. So 
That's it. Thank you so much. Okay. Doesn't look, thank you for those comments. Doesn't look like we have any more in person online. This is the moderator. If you're online and would like to participate, click on the hand outline that may be at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. For those calling in, star three to raise your virtual hand. No requests at this time. Thank you. Um, we'll bring it back in. Any follow up questions, comments from the board? Any responses to any of that, Mr. Brodea? Um, I mean, there is a question, a substantive question about what constitutes incompetence and negligence. Maybe you want to highlight one case or something that comes to mind. And then on the deceased members, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's been brought to your attention before. Yeah, let's tackle the deceased canceled members first. Um, so right now, it just, uh, when a licensee dies, passes away, the way the law is set up is for an automatic cancellation of their license. From a legal perspective, this just makes it simple, right? That uh, it goes, uh, you, the individual is not renewing, therefore they have three years to be delinquent, and then the license cap cancels. We can understand that that looks challenging for the public looking at a license uh, or for even licensees looking up other licensees and seeing delinquent when they passed away already. Um, but it's just a matter of operation of law. So we are working with a retired license status. Uh, obviously that one's gonna be a bit more voluntary and people can turn to that one. Um, it's kind of hard to mandate the family of a licensee to send a death certificate. What if they don't have a family? Um, you know, at that point, that's kind of why it just automatically times out. It doesn't look great, but it's just a matter of like operation of law, if I can use that here. Um, and then in terms of the um, unprofessional behavior, is that it? Uh, incompetence. Incompetence. Uh, so we look for the conditions of office for like what our enforcement uh, regulations and statutes state. And then when we see it as a possible violation of that, um, that's when it's identified as uh, there's a legitimate complaint here uh, and we send it to a subject matter expert and the subject matter expert makes the final determination. They can make the determination that it's not the case that it's a departure from a standard of care, um, but they can make the case that it is. And then we move on what they've identified and then they have a source uh, why this is a departure from standard of care and they usually provide sources. Um, that said, uh, the board has a number of subject matter experts that it sends uh, these reports to, and it's subject to that interpretation and a back and forth between the analysts and the board. So it's kind of hard to uh, just blanket, come out with a blanket statement of this is unprofessional conduct. Uh, technically, kind of like the ethics discussion, the profession should be actively engaged in establishing and maintaining a dynamic category for what is unprofessional conduct or incompetence, things of this nature, because the licensees are establishing the standards of care. Now, uh, we hope that licensees agree with this. Uh, we do see that the profession is uh, spread across various associations, various modalities and language associations. So it'd be helpful for the profession to come together and identify best practices as well. Uh, clean needle technique is used often. Uh, to identify a number of the departures or incompetence. Uh, Mr. Miller identified the button ringing uh, or not having a button for an emergency access to the practitioner while in the middle of the treatment. This is critical, but it's not in our laws and regs. It is something that most, well, our subject matter experts identify as the case. And I believe it's in clinical technique, but don't quote me on that one. Uh, there are sources, no? from CCAHM, uh, I'm getting a, hot, a nod no. So uh, there are some sources and specifically subject matter experts that weigh in on this. And, and just, just so I know, thank you, that was helpful. When you, when we're categorizing um, incompetence, negligence versus, for example, unpro unprofessional conduct, and those are our two biggest categories. Um, 
maybe maybe just an example of one and not what's an example of unprofessional conduct um and and not to put you on the spot but it, it is helpful for me to think about why would something be unprofessional conduct and not incompetence or negligence or vice versa right i just because they are such a both of those are large categories of what we're seeing um you know it would be helpful to think about it I have two excellent experts with us today. Uh, Christine Brothers did uh, act as the enforcement analyst for a number of years with the board, and Jay Hurt is a licensee. So why don't we start with Christine? Uh, perhaps you have cases that more readily come to mind, although it's been a little bit of time. I mean, what we use to guide um, in categorizing it is the uh, enforcement section of our law. So 4955, I think there's like seven different subsections there that outline specific incidences of um, unprofessional conduct. Um, and then it goes into um, negligence um, and incompetence, those sections. So that's what we're using. Um, usually if there's patient harm involved and, and when you're seeing this category, categorized, this is based off our read of a complaint during intake. So there could be more that's learned throughout the investigation where it could be recategorized um or um jay i overheard you it could be it could be unprofessional conduct as well as negligence or incompetence so um once the investigation is complete that is when we rely upon um an expert to opine uh where are you seeing these departures and um what violations are be being substantiated um and again, yes, they always cite sources. So that's really what we use. It's just a, during intake, it's just us going off of what has been explained in the complaint and categorizing it best as possible. Cause we can only fit it under one um, in our database at the time, so. So, yeah, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you know, an example of negligence would be something like um, somebody came in, got a neurothorax, called the acupuncturist, and the acupuncturist said, oh, go home, take an aspirin, and whatever. And then they end up in the emergency room, and the doctor figures out it's due to a needle, whatever. So that could be a, an example of negligence, but that also would relate in to unprofessional conduct as well. Um, things like billing fraud, things like that, that could end up to be uh, unprofessional conduct. Um, chart notes is another real issue where there's just completely absence of really any clarity of that. And so if there's an enforcement case, that'll be cited as an unprofessional conduct as well. So, you know, but but um, as Christine mentioned, they can double up together. So if you're a gross negligence or um, um, what's the other category? Yeah, 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 repeated. Uh, it's going to result in unprofessional conduct. And it's and it's based on um, what Christine mentioned in uh, BPC 4955. That's it. And additional resources for the public and for the members and staff are prior disciplines that are posted on our website. You can take a look at the accusation. You can take the final determination. Uh, it, it shows exactly why they're being accused of what they're doing, and uh, it could be reviewed uh, by our profession to kind of establish a standard. Sorry, I wanted to add one thing. Also, a few years ago, I think it was 2019. Um, we did put a publication out of the top 10 violations that we commonly see, and that is posted on our website. And that gets a little more specific in what we see as trends. Um, and yeah, that's on our website. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. You have another public comment? Uh, we closed it. I'll open it up just, just really quickly, um, and then we'll move on. But sure. Just a brief follow up. You asked for uh, an example and you gave where to go look for an example. And that's where I got my example it was somebody had filed a complaint that they felt abandoned. And they yelled out for the acupuncturist and and uh, they brought up a case and the guy and this woman uh, didn't have a, a bell or a buzzer. And when I read that and I come to all these meetings and I'm pretty up to date and I had no clue that I had to have a bell or a buzzer. I mean, and I've been telling other people I went. I, bells for all my rooms, but I'm a pretty well informed practitioner and I found it just because I read those things, but it, it's happening more and more and more. So I want to be preventative. And there's no place like she said, there's no rep. Christine said there's no 
specific regulation about having a buzzer, but there was about being abandoned or something like that. And so, you know, I'd like to try to figure out a, a, a more exact list than to just put it on us to go through and read all the things that have happened before. And then, and now I'm bringing one to your attention and it's like, well, you know, I don't know what to do about that. And so I, I as, as a representative, don't know what to do about that. How do I inform our members about what some of these violations are? And if it's not written in stone, then we, we need to maybe have a, a workshop or some kind of um, subcommittee on, on those violations so that we can get the word out and do a better job. Thank you. Any final thoughts before we close the session? So I thought uh, this is a very good suggestion. Uh, so we will have an upcoming uh, the, uh, mandate the four hours of CEO about the laws and the ethics. I think maybe we can uh, put this uh, button, call button to uh, the education, CEO education. I have a, I have a quick uh, comment. Um, since uh, it reminds me of uh, the CAB, uh, I mean, tail exam is to, uh, to test uh, the minimum competency of the, the applicants like to practice the, the uh, acupuncture. But whereas when it comes to the discipline, uh, you see all kinds of uh, basic things that it's not specified. So I hear a lot of complaints from the other uh, uh, colleagues saying what, what we, we shouldn't do or it, because it doesn't say it. Everything, it, it cannot dictate everything. So I think it's very important to uh, go over this uh, four-hour CEO of law and ethics because if you don't teach it in the school and test in, on the exam and then you get the you get you you didn't know you you bio, you, know, you know violating this uh, regulation or the basic basic professional conduct or whatever that uh, the procedure that, that we have to follow in, in the under the state of California so law. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just uh, want to echo what earlier Mr. Bodia has mentioned. I've been thinking about other profession, like for the medical uh, medical board, or uh, we have you know California Medical Association, and also I'm in you know it's like a member of my own society of internal medicine. So normally we have like a standard of uh, care or standard of a uh, practice, but that's more come from association or licensees, and I want to echo because. You know, the board is here not to, you know, develop all those guidelines. So I want to put it back to the stakeholder, the licensees. Maybe this is a very good ways, you know, how you guys can form some of the consensus, especially the future of the education and the ethics. And those kind of the information uh, can be formed as a guidelines. And maybe those, the numbers, you know, can be dropped, the, those complaints can be dropped. So I just wanted to add it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, that brings item number five to a conclusion. We are at, let's see, 1053 ish. Maybe take a little bit of a break for folks to use the restroom, stretch the legs, and then come back for items number six and seven before we do that. So, um, what time is it? Uh, how about uh, 11 05? Is that okay? Okay. Okay, we'll jump into item number six, the legislative update. And this is Brothers. Okay. Um, so, uh, we just have a report of all of the updates to all the bills that we've been tracking over the year, um, this past year, um, there were 7 bills that were chaptered and all of the bills that were chaptered those going to affect uh, January 1st of 2024, unless another date was specified. So.
So the first bill um, that was chaptered is our sunset bill, AB 1264. Um, and this was um, signed in, by the governor actually after the completion of this report um, on, on October 10th. Um, just to kind of recap what the bill does, it does extend our authority, our authority for four years until January 1st, 2028. It also establishes some definitions and criteria for a supervising acupuncturist and acupuncture assistant, um, allowing somebody without a license um, that meets specific criteria to perform basic supportive acupuncture procedures. It also um, updates reference to uh, Accreditation Commission for Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine um, to Accreditation Commission for Acupuncture and Herbal Medicine, and wherever that um, is referenced in statute. Um, it also, a uh, big one, authorizes the board or its designee, which is uh, generally Division of Investigation through DCA, upon complaint to inspect specified premises, places of practice, or clinics. Um, it also requires that specified records be open to inspection in response to a complaint. Uh, and then there was just a technical cleanup related to the wall license, um, the deletion of the requirement that requires an acupuncture to be responsible for Asian massage. Um, it's just basically removing redundancy since we already referenced section 4937 and Asian massage is listed under that section. And then getting into the board implementation plan, what we're going to be doing um, once it's in law, we will be communicating this new inspection authority to the division of investigation who conducts um, the majority of our formal, well, all of our formal investigations. And then we'll um, edit and add the amended laws within the board's laws and regulations booklet, which is a PDF post on our website. Um, and we will also send notice of the new laws to all licensees and stakeholders uh, via uh, electronic listserv and postal mail. And then the other bills I'm just gonna name off, I'm not gonna recap what they are um, or what they do, I should say, um, that were chaptered, that's SB 544, that's on Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act teleconferencing. I will note that there were quite a bit of changes to that bill after we last met, so you just wanna read over those um, it doesn't really streamline our ability to tell, have teleconferences like uh, during the pandemic, um, but it is an alternate route, um, very specific um, to, to hold it via teleconference. Um, and then AB 883, that was on the U.S. Department of Defense Skill Bridge Program. That was signed by the governor October 7th. It's now chaptered. And then um, the other bills that you see, if, it, if it's um, dead for 2023, that, doesn't, that means it may get picked up um, in 2024, or it could be a different legislative vehicle. We'll go ahead and track those as well. Um, AB 1707 on health professionals and facilities regarding adverse actions based on another state's law. That is now in chaptered into law. Senate Bill 259, report submitted to the Legislative Committee or committees. Senate Bill 345, healthcare services, legally protected healthcare activities. And then Senate Bill 372, which is the DCA wide um, licensing and registrant records, uh, name and gender changes. And that's really all I have. Um, I don't know if you have any comments or questions. Um, thank you, Ms. Brothers. And Ms. Brodea, did you want to give a brief update on the, uh, the sunset bill is great news. And then we got, you know, there is, um, it does say here that we got extended to January 1st, 2028. So we will not have to, and was that expected or is that? Uh, I've never an expectation with the legislature, uh, although we have been improving. Or maybe it's wise not to expect it from the legislature. Uh, but yes, uh, the, the board has been diligent in its work in the last four years and has accomplished a lot. Uh, the site inspection authority was actually one of our strategic plan items uh, in the last session uh, that we were able to address right before the uh, development of the next one. So uh, excellent uh, work on staff part and the board staff. Um, yeah, and I just want to thank again um, the members who were 
uh, present for for that hearing and just getting that across the finish line. So thank you again. Um, in terms of going forward and tr uh, for the Laird bill, the teleconferencing, I just want to make uh, I want to clarify. So yeah. to the extent that any teleconference meetings are held now, the majority of the board needs to be at one location. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Yeah, uh, exceeding fifty percent, I believe. Happy to jump in. So essentially, beginning in January, you'll have four options. Uh, option one is this option where we're all gathered together in one physical space. We're not required to have anything online. Option two is a teleconference option where members can be at different locations, uh, connected by telephone or electronically, um, but all of those locations have to be publicly noticed. Um, so that's option two. Option three is the new one the bill introduces. That is one where a majority has to be in the single space like this. And then additional members above a majority could appear that way remotely. Um, and, uh, but you'd still have to have a majority gathered in, in one space. So that's really for that, the member that has an emergency that comes up or something like that, or some need that they can't make it here or to wherever the physical location is. And then option four really is for advisory bodies. So that really wouldn't affect this body. Thank you. And then for uh, there's a slight difference between option two and three with uh, option two being the traditional teleconferencing. Uh, our legal counsel noted that we have to have it publicly noticed. That does mean that that location is open to the public. So if a member is looking to have that publicly noticed, they'll be having public member members of the public in their house if it's at their house. So uh, it you need to be in a public location willing to receive the public there. Uh, and then for the third option, I believe that you don't have to list the address, correct? For the individuals that are, that's right you only have to notice the one site where the majority is but the other members that were appearing say from their homes they would not need to notice that site thank you any additional questions or clarifications from the board i do want to underline it is uh, a, more of a situation to allow for those emergency uh, moments uh, it could be a headache to say okay whose turn is it this time to meet from remotely, um, but it's really just to facilitate more meetings. Thank you. Uh, we can open this up for public comment unless there's other questions or comments. Let's hear from uh, the public. Neil Miller, Cal Atma. Uh, I have a question regarding the Open Meeting Act. Um, we can still have meetings throughout the state. In other words, we're here in Sacramento and our history has been to try to put it around the state to get more people involved. So we could be in San Diego, LA Bay area and here for the four meeting. That's correct. Okay. And, um, I'm sorry. I didn't hear a B 996 Lowe's bill. Did that pass or it was put on hold? It's dead for 2023. It's dead, yeah. That's we, for, so we were, yeah, it's dead it's held for over. 2023. Yeah, it could go and be brought up in 2024, but for 2023, it didn't pass. Right, or it could be gutted and something else could be put. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. It doesn't look like we have any other comments here in person. Madam moderator will go online. This is the moderator. If you're logged in and would like to participate, the instructions are on the screen. You can click the outline of a hand, typically located bottom center of your WebEx screen. If you're calling in, press star three to raise your virtual hand. No request at this time. Thank you so much. We'll bring it back and you do not need a motion from us. Correct. Great. Receiving file. Thank you very much. We'll move on to item number 7, which is the re regulatory update. Okay, uh, the 1st. 2 rulemaking packages that are listed relate to the disciplinary guidelines and uniform standards that we just went over. Um, so. We just made revisions to the proposed language and um, 
now. Is your microphone on? Sorry, is it? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Maybe I need to get no, closer. I, sorry. I just don't think, yeah. Thank you. Um, so the status is that the board just approved uh, the revisions to the proposed language. And so we will carry on with um, making changes to the initial statement of reasons to match that and work with the regulatory unit, move forward in the rulemaking process. Um, that's the first two packages there. Uh, the third align curriculum standards and approval related regulations with statute. Um, that package was converted to a section 100 package and it was filed with OAL on June 30th. We did withdraw the package on August 4th. Um, an OAL, OAL attorney um, met with us and there was just some technical cleanup that was necessary. Um, and then some of the proposed changes we will need to pull out into a regular rulemaking. Um, but the majority of those uh, proposed changes can be done via section 100 change, which is um, a lot quicker. So that will be refiled at a later date. The fourth package relates to AB 2190. It's the application process for licensing examination and re-examination and criteria and procedures for approval of a credential evaluation service. So the regulatory package was submitted to OAL August 28th and the notice was published on September 8th. It was held, a 45 day public comment period was held um, and actually just closed October 24th. Um, we did not receive any comments. Um, so the package we're working on the final filing phase and finalizing uh, the final package, which will go to the department. Um, the application for retired status uh, res and restoration, uh, we the board did approve regulatory language in August 2019. The package has been under development um, and I just uh, worked on some revisions actually to the proposed language. So that should be coming to a future board meeting next year. The continuing education requirements uh, for law and ethics, which um, a couple of people brought up. Brought up. Um, so edits were last brought to the June 23 meeting um, and approved by the board and the regulatory package was submitted to the director August 11th. The package was approved by agency and was uh, sent to OAL October 6th. It is currently in a 45 day public comment and it closes November 21st. If we do not receive any comments, um, then the package just moves into the filing, filing phase. Um, if comments are received, then uh, we will um, bring those to the board to review uh, with recommended responses. Standards of practice for telehealth services. Um, the board did approve that regulatory language in March 2021. Uh, today, we actually have some uh, revisions and some edits for uh, the board to discuss as the next item. And then the hand hand hygiene requirements. This was an older package that was um, a lower priority. Um, however, um, the reg unit did weigh in on it recently and um, the board in 2018 actually still wanted to proceed with it. So um, recently, I we've staff has made some changes and we're going over that uh, with the regulatory unit uh, soon. So probably next year. You'll see that as well. And that concludes the report. Thank you. And this is helpful. I mean, I think it shows you just how long it, it takes to get through the process, you know, I mean, and, and um, changing regulations, passing legislation purposely isn't easy. And, and there, there are sort of checks and balances for a reason so that you just don't jam something through, but uh, just for the, you know, public's knowledge, you know, we, there's things on here that, you know, we approved in 2018 that are still kind of working their way through. Right. So, um, and that is what it is. So, but there's some important stuff on here. So, um, any questions, comments from board members about any of this, some of this telehealth and obviously the disciplinary guidelines we, we just talked about, but, uh, any other items that anyone wants to comment on? Mr. Roday, anything to add about any of this? 
Only it's encouraging to see us getting through a number of these, especially the disciplinary guidelines. That's definitely been a long time in the making. And, uh, very happy to see these go through. Why don't we open this up for public comment uh, first here in person and then see if anyone online has any comments. And we will be discussing telehealth next, so that's that's something that will come up again. But um, we can go, Madam Moderator, to online, see if we have any comments. This is the moderator. The instructions are on the screen for your reference. If you're logged in and would like to participate, you can raise your hand by pressing on the hand outline, typically bottom center of your WebEx screen. If you're calling in, press star three from your phone to raise your virtual hand. No request at this time. Thank you. We'll bring it back. Uh, board members, any final thoughts before we move on? Thank you for the update. This is brothers, we will move on to item number 8, which is the. Uh, deeper conversation about the telehealth uh, services regulation. Okay, so this relates to um, it's uh, business and professions code section 2290.5. That is the authority um, provided for uh, division two healing arts licensees, um, allowing them to uh, conduct telehealth. Um, but we need to have a regulation in place in order to um, have the standards and all of that set in place. So um, we do um, just as a background, uh, the board did meet in um, March 25th, 2021, and it did vote to approve uh, the proposed regulatory text um, and directed staff to initiate a rulemaking process. Um, when we initiated the rulemaking documents, we worked with new regulatory council, and at that time, um, there were some additional edits to address clarity, consistency, and thoroughness. Um, and so we just have these revisions here. You'll see any changes um, in yellow highlight. Um, and so the first um, change that you'll see is we just change the order in more sequential logical order um, to subsection B. And then we also clarified that informed consent can be done verbally or in writing. We also um, added, um, let's see, added an additional concern to cover during informed consent, which is potential risks and limitations of receiving, receiving treatment via telehealth. Uh, we also added standards for recording patient consent when administered verbally and when provided in writing. And also added a requirement that a licensee shall provide the patient uh, with their license number uh, during uh, telehealth appointment. Um, and then I guess again, we added 2290.5 under the authority section. So we're just re recommending um, that the proposed edits be adopted, and there is a recommended motion language here provided, which would also require that the prior um, board's March 2021 order um, or adoption be rescinded. Um, and then behind the memo, uh, you'll see the specific little changes um, that we made since you last approved it in yellow highlight. Any questions? Yeah, I mean, I guess the uh, whenever it comes to telehealth and um, and the profession, you know, I do think that obviously a lot of this, you know, was um, prompted by the pandemic, and and obviously the profession has changed because of that, and will continue to change and and adapt. But did we did we feel that the we're clarifying now? on the consent, whether it's verbal or written, um, was there something that happened that that made us um, rethink and, and clarify it? Were, were many of our licensees doing it verbally and we wanted more of a written um, action? Uh, because, you know, you would think if you're doing it, you would envision that a lot of this was happening, uh, a lot of the consent was happening via telehealth meeting, right? I mean, obviously, if you're talking about telehealth, especially during the pandemic, 
this was probably being done not in person, so it was probably harder to get written consent if someone is in front of their computer and you're in front of theirs. So, but did something happen or was it just, you know, we need Nothing in particular. Um, I know that a number of boards um, put telehealth um, regulations through. And so when we submitted this to the reg unit, um, this was something that um, kind of best practices we've seen other boards address informed consent this way. Um, so that's why it was provided um, these edits to mm -hmm. the language, not really tying back to it happening uh, with the profession. But definitely we want to have, you know, some criteria and standards and uh, practice in place um, addressed with informed consent. Got it. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mateki. Yeah, I saw you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm glad that this is brought up because uh, for physicians, we use uh, telehealth a lot. And even before we started um, being on the medical record, we have to have that, you know, this is a televisit and also the consent up in the front. Um, also, even in the consent, the language, we have to see patients in the safe area has to be in California. Like if they are outside of the state, you know, I can't give any consul, consultation advice. So I'm just saying this is, is, it is for the best the practice and other profession are doing that as required. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question, President. And just a reminder for folks, uh, this regulation is deriving its authority from a general BPC code that allows for telehealth to happen uh, to all, a number of the healing arts boards. So what we're doing is we're codifying it in our regulations here and making it tailored to acupuncture services. So do we have any cases violated? The tele health in acupuncture profession. I'll tell you all. I'm not allowed to comment on any cases or complaints that haven't been finalized, and I don't recall anything that has been finalized uh, regarding telehealth. Just say, do we see any violations? Yeah, violation or potential possible, so we can make a standard to prevent. It. I'm not, I'm, I'm no longer in enforcement, so I'm not seeing day to day, like the complaints that are coming in, but, um, it's, I would hope that, um, if there, if that is coming in, that we're sub subcategorizing that probably in our report quarterly to you as a, like unprofessional conduct, um, like we do in the report. So I think we could, we could definitely look at that and see if we. That's a trend that we're receiving. I, I, I'm unsure. Okay. We don't really not, not something obvious. Called out. Right. Mm -hmm. And really it's a, uh, we're, we're. The responsibility is on the uh, practitioner as to what they can provide, what they should be providing. And again, it comes down to the profession and uh, common sense as to establishing standards of care, uh, you know, like. You don't want someone carrying out an operation on themselves, you know, and I would say 99.999% of the situations, uh, unless super dire emergency, and then we don't want to bring that up here. So, you know, uh, yeah, we'll look, we will be vigilant as to what kind of cases are coming in. And if the profession is developing standards on it too that go above and beyond this, uh, we'll be hearing it through our subject matter experts as well as uh, whenever the associations bring it to our attention. Why don't we open this up for public comment? I have a. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, comment. Francisco. Yeah. Please. Yeah. I have a, a colleague who's working at a hospital uh, facility, and uh, a lot of them in, in uh, over there they they think that acupuncture is for like face to face and then hands on and then actually insert in the needle, but actually. Uh, I sometimes I get some some phone calls like uh, from a let's say a cancer patient. They are in much of pain size. They taking their pain pill. They want to you know get some of my opinion. Then sometimes I 
you know, what do you have in the, in the home and maybe you have some turmeric and you just take it like that, you know, they kind of, uh, kind of, I think, uh, establish the telehealth and also, uh, for the COVID patients, they don't want to come in and we don't want to see them. Then you can make a actual, uh, telehealth, uh, contact and then prescribe the medicine and then send it to them. So they can establish. So it's a good thing to make a rulemaking in, in that, for that case. Yeah. Fundamentally, this increases access to acupuncture in California. Thank you for that comment. Uh, any public comment here in the room or online? moderator the instructions are on the screen for your reference if you're logged in and would like to participate click on the outline of a hand which is typically located bottom center of your webex screen if you're calling in press star three to raise your virtual hand at this time i see no requests online great thank you um, any questions or comments before the motion and the model, the model language, which is on, um, page 2 of 3 of the report, uh, can probably easiest just for someone who's making the motion to read that. We have long recommended motion language today. So this is, um, it's also, uh, Dr. Chen did the last 1. any other <laughs> volunteers in that subject to that? Okay. I'll do it. Okay. Thank you. Francisco. Okay. I'd like, I'd like to make more, uh. I'd like to move a motion to approve as amended, move to approve the proposed regulatory text as amended. Yeah, go to the, the option one, Francisco. Okay, um, sorry. Okay, so I'd like to move uh, a motion to approve. Uh, we send the board's March 2021 order to initiate a rulemaking for this proposal and Instead, authorize a rulemaking using the proposed language with all of the changes to Division 13.7, Article 5, Section 1399.452.1. The board authorizes initiation and possible adoption of new text as follows. Direct staff to submit the text to the Director of the Department of Cons Consumer Affairs and the Business, Consumer of uh, consumer services and housing agents C4 review and if no adverse comments are received, authorize the executive officer to take all steps necessary to comment. I mean, uh, to initiate the rulemaking process, make any uh, non substantive 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 changes to the package and set the matter for a hearing if we request it. If no adverse comments are received during the 45 day comment period and no hearing is requested, adopt new section 1399.452.1 of Article 5 of Division 13.7 of the Title 16 of CCR as noted. And authorize the executive officer to take all steps necessary to comp complete the rulemaking. Thank you so much. Do I have a second? I second that. Thank you very much. We'll do a roll call. John Harabedian? Yes. Young Ping Chen? Yes. Ruben Osorio? Yes. Francisco Kim? Yes. Chu Dong Lee? Yes. Dr. Amy Mteki? Motion passes. Excellent. Thank you. We will now move on to item number 10, I think is where we are. Excuse me, 11, which was 12. <laughs> 11 is returned open. We'll just keep going down. Committee assignments, uh, and that is me, but uh, I will kick it to our executive director just to kind of, this will be a quick item. Um, and maybe, Ben, you can let folks know what we're doing here. Certainly, uh, these are the committee assignments. These are subcommittees under the acupuncture board. 
comprised of the members you see here. I'll go ahead and read it. For the licensing committee, we have Francisco Kim as the chair, uh, Dr. Yang Ping Chen as a member. And then for the enforcement committee, we have uh, member Osorio as the chair and Dr. Mateki as a member. And each of these committees, the goal of these committees are to start tackling the work uh, that will come before the full board so that board members are more familiar uh, with the work at an earlier stage in the process and uh, have more uh, input into that process as well. And uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the strategic plan items that you will see that we develop tomorrow will be referred to these committees for action planning and for uh, guarding through the process as it gets developed. Any questions? I think for, and thank you for that. I think for the public, um, there was a question as to, you know, future items for agendas uh, or agendas, uh, items for future agendas. Were, is the committee process, and, you know, we can, there's a lot of ways that items can get on future agendas, mm -hmm. but in your opinion, and is the process going forward going to be one of which the committees, especially because licensing and enforcement does encap they respectively do encapsulate a lot of the issues that we're talking about. Well, do you envision kind of newer items working through committees before coming through to the full board or could there be, and is that the route that you would recommend to members of the public? Uh, or do you think that there could be, you know, are there circumstances where committees will not be tackling some of these items in the full board uh, may actually, you know, be considering them without committee input. Thank you for that question. Yes, it could be a, a spectrum of uh, situations as you just described. Um, some items can be taken up by the committees first and others by the full board first. Um, the hope is that we can provide appropriate attention for some of the more nuanced items to have discussion at the licensing at the committee level as opposed to at the full board level so that we've ironed out most of the kinks uh, by the time we get to the full board meeting. Not to say that that discussion can't happen after the fact. Uh, in terms of the process for actually including future agenda items, suggested future agenda items, um, we can definitely look at that. It can come through either pathway. Uh, future agenda items are established by the president and the board president in coordination with the executive officer. Uh, priorities are provided, uh, are given to the board's needed actions and then uh, whatever additional time is possible. Uh, to provide on the additional items. And uh, we could definitely look to have a, a pathway for the public. Um, right now, our administrative procedures manual uh, calls out that uh, the future agenda items only as it pertains to board member suggestions, where the manual uh, states that uh, all efforts should be provided to provide a board members suggested future agenda items within at least two meetings of the suggestion date and that they work with the president. So we can, uh, it is time to revisit our administrative procedures manual. Uh, that should be looked at every four to five years as well. Uh, and uh, we could look at creating a pathway for, uh, a more memorializing a pathway for the public, although usually just the suggestions and then discussion. I think uh, in what we can do, what I can do now is just in discussing uh, future agendas with you and Madam Vice President, uh, we can be sure to review what was last suggested uh, by the public. Thank you for that. And um, we used to have an education committee, I believe. There, were, uh, and maybe I'm missing one other, but we have consolidated. And I think for folks may maybe looking and saying, okay, we only have two committees: licensing and enforcement. Where does education fall in? Where does you know maybe some other items that the public might be thinking about? So maybe kind of give us a flavor of what you think licensing enforcement's a little bit more straightforward, but um, would education fall under licensing um, and what else would be, would fall under licensing in your opinion? Indeed, Ex education would fall under licensing, continuing education. Um, we used to have the legislative and executive committee as well as on top of the education committee and these two here. Uh, and what we found was that uh, the board president can create ad hoc committees to address whatever problem arises. Uh, and so creating the, the executive and the legislative uh, committee had kind of just been pivoting to whatever was necessary and wasn't having any items to really discuss. They were just addressing meeting with representatives, if that were the case, or with department representatives. Uh, so 
it wasn't as essential. Uh, so going forward, the, we're just going to exercise uh, the president's ability to create ad hoc committees to address situations as they arise. Thank you. And do any of the members that have been appointed um, have any concerns or um, would rather not serve on these committees? And I do appreciate it. And obviously, um, there will be more work outside of the committee. So, uh, Mr. Lee and I um, are not getting off scot free for sure. I mean, there's going to be plenty of other things to do. Um, but I think this is really important. I mean, from I am envisioning a lot of our substantive work being done at the committee level. We used to do that. We sort of turned away from it. Um, because of you know the pandemic and other things and i think now jumping back into it it'll it'll lead to some great outcomes so i do appreciate um staff putting this together Ms. Berdea, and i do uh want to hear you know we don't we don't need any formal motion here um but i do want to hear from the public on this before we, we move on to the uh next item so i'll open this up for public comment Leo Miller from Cal Atma. Um, we had a education curriculum competency committee. We had an education committee and then schools felt that that wasn't the name of the game. It would be curriculum competency. So we had a whole nother year of hearings of curriculum competence. And it's important, especially for the public members to know that that education committee and the curriculum competency committee say that our education should be around 3,800 hours. And we have 300, 3,000 hours now because of legislative and political compromises that were made. But as public members, it's real important that you know that this body had two years of work. It wasn't just the committee, uh, the members of the committee, but you enrolled the leaders in the profession, the schools and the profession, and we all came together and we didn't all agree, but in the end, there was a report that was made back to the committee. The education committee said that our education should be about 3,800 hours. And the schools protested and said, no, oh, it's about curriculum competency. So we did the whole process again, and it was about 3,800 hours. So I mean, I may be going back, you know, 10, 12, 15 years. So if it was 3,800 hours 15 years ago, where is it at now? So if you're gonna add another committee and one that would really enroll uh, the stakeholders, then I would recommend that we have an education and curriculum competency committee so we can discuss what is necessary to provide the le minimal level of education that best serves and protects the public based on our skills. Most of that work has already been done. If you don't have the copies of all that material, I have all the materials and the reports that went back to the board. So I think that, that it would be incumbent upon all of you to look at the work that's already been done and maybe build off of that going forward. Thank you. Doesn't look like we have any other comments here in person. We'll go online. This is the moderator. The instructions are on the screen for your reference. If you're logged in and would like to participate, click the outline of a hand, typically bottom center of your WebEx screen. If you're calling in, press star three to raise your virtual hand. At this time, I see no requests. Thank you so much. Just one uh, comment I forgot to mention earlier. Uh, you'll note that these committees have two members, and this is so that we can more readily facilitate the work. This doesn't require that we uh, have to meet in person. Uh, the two members as the committee members, we can meet remotely and have it open up to the public. Uh, these committees won't be making any policy, policy decisions on behalf of the board. They'll just be approving what and discussing what the board will then be reviewing. So this is really an attempt to streamline the board's uh, uh, processes in addressing issues, whether it's new committees or the ones established. Thank you. 
Yeah, and thank you for the comment on education. I mean, we did. Um, I mean, we did think about the education committee and kind of historically what it served and going forward and and you know as Mr. Boudet said there this does not limit us and what we can do in committees we could tomorrow the vice president and I could create a ad hoc committee on education and and curriculum competency if we needed it so I, I think that we shouldn't feel like this is limiting us in any way um, but I do appreciate the comment about uh, the historical, which predates, I think, everyone here. I don't think anyone was here when when any of that was happening. So I, I appreciate that that historical um, that that piece that that did happen. Um, so thank you for that. Any other comments for for this item? Go ahead, Francisco. Yeah. Uh, relating to Mr. Miller's uh, 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 suggestion, um, I think the, to make uh, this profession be more uh, efficient to serve the public and you know we need to have a, a, a all this party like from consumers uh, regulatory agency and uh, profession uh, as a as a as a consumers i think it's kind of given because there's a, a condition and that's so called market they demand certain quality and certain number of you know uh, providers uh, for education, I think schools been around for a long time and they know what they're doing. But uh, in terms of uh, uh, to make uh, to a person to be licensed to practice and serve the uh, the public, I think you need to have a very competent with uh, the market uh, expectation and demand. So far, I think the number of licenses are. Uh, is, uh, uh, Going down, and uh, one of them is, you know, as a, as a as a practitioner, uh, there there is a market for acupuncturist uh, uh, position. I mean, they're demanding more and more, but the the, uh, the their the salary is between like even below 30, 40, 80, maximum is hundred twenty dollars per hour. Why? Because uh, the, the 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 insurance and all the market set for the acupuncture session for 15 minutes of service as 40 minutes. I mean the 40 dollars. So that that you know kind of constitute the, the salary of the, the acupuncturist. Uh, so uh, what we are talking about is uh, competency. Yes, so we need to have more. Uh, Better, better education and training, but also uh, you, you need to have a, a, like align with the uh, market expect, expectation and standard. So, uh, what I suggest is, uh, I know you've been you've been attending board meeting for many many years, but uh, we need more participation as a one professional uh, association to represent the voice of the profession. And along with the school and other associations, we can, I think, uh, develop more uh, suggestions so that uh, board can accommodate the, those uh, uh, suggestions into the, uh, you know, uh, regulatory, regulatory uh, uh, reform. Thank you. Great. Okay, thank you. Let's move on to item number 12, which is or 13, setting the calendar for future future meetings. Uh, Mr. Bode, do you want to kind of highlight what uh, you had in mind in terms of potential dates? Certainly. Um, I have some suggestions. These suggestions are uh, timed such that we would be able to provide uh, comment to any legislation. That is uh, that may affect acupuncture. Or acupuncture would like to take a position on, uh, and so we've used the legislative calendar for the tentative 2024 legislative calendar to uh, set up some dates. I'm recommending that we look at three dates. We're mandated to have two meetings um, throughout the year. Uh, one must be in Northern California. One must be in Southern California. I'm asking that we set the date for three different meetings. Uh, and to save it as two day meetings for now, uh, which we could always pair back or pull back if we don't need it. Um, and then leaving a 
the fourth meeting open so that we can schedule that uh, towards the end of the year as needed, uh, when needed. And uh, I'll go ahead and provide my suggestions and uh, we can take comments as to people's availabilities or if there's another set of dates that you would like. Uh, the first uh, meeting that I would recommend would be March 14th and 15th or 21st and 22nd. And the options I'll give you would be two weeks next to each other uh, in a specific month. Then again in June, on June 6th and 7th, or 13th and 14th. And then August 8th and 9th, or 15th and 16th. And uh, I'm recommending the first set for each of those months, uh, first set of dates for each of those months, if possible. Uh, and then again, if there are dates that work better uh, for board members around those times, that's great, or whatever works best for you. Shall we start with June? Does uh, the second and third week of March look okay for everybody with uh, 14th, 15th being prepared, preferred? I'm just looking at my calendar. Actually, 21st and 22nd works better for me, but if it works better okay. for everyone else, obviously I'll board member happy to make any any of these work. So, yeah, so we're looking at March 14th, 15th, or the 21st and 22nd. Is and is that going to be in Southern California? You said, or is that the Northern California? One? Uh, we can set that now. I okay. hadn't uh, set uh, any specific locations, although it might be uh, cheaper, less tourist season in the winter time. San Diego yeah. or Los Angeles? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I'm hearing things. I can't really hear what's being said, but San Diego's San Diego. thrown out there. Um, well, let's just let's just go around each of us. So um, March 14th, 15th, before we talk about location or 21st and 22nd. Either one works for you guys. Either one. OK, well, then can we, let's just do 21st and 22nd Perfect. if we can. Um, and then let's move on to the next, the June. 6th and 7th or 13th and 14th do those weekends work for folks or weeks for any conflicts for anyone okay then let's do the 6th and 7th yep. for june and then i think you wanted the second for august you had said you'd want you wanted 8th and 9th so uh -huh. okay yeah that's fine Eighth and ninth work for Come members. Okay. Oh, okay. End of May. And so we are, I mean, March, May, June, June, July. The June and August meetings are pretty close back. They to are back. close. What, what do you, is there a reason? Remind me of the legislative session ends when? September. Session ends August 31st. That's the last day for the House to pass bills. August 23rd is the last day to amend the bills. Uh, so if we wanted to, if the board wanted to take a position uh, on the 8th or 9th or the 15th and 16th, we'd be able to move, uh, meet with a um, legislator to address that and put that Got position it. out there. Um, nothing to prevent us from doing it later. Yeah. Other than well, we, and we could always set the date now. And if, if we didn't need it, we could always push. So, Indeed. okay. Uh, so then again, uh, 8th and 9th. We had a competition, so you're okay for it. June meeting. Mm -hmm. So 8th and 9th then? 8th and 9th of August work for everybody? Yep. Okay. Shall we establish locations? San Diego, Bay Area, Los Angeles? Um, yeah. Uh, why don't we... <laughs> why don't we do... Um, I guess my preference would be work our way south up so maybe do san diego los angeles in june and then august but san francisco area area so march we do at san diego mm -hmm. uh june we'll do los angeles and then um august we can do it okay. in the bay last time god it's been a little while since we were we were in berkeley last time or was it yeah that was four years ago. Yep. And San Jose at five branches. That was when was that was a 2019. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, that was the one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was 2018 October. Yeah. 
All right. Um, thank you, board members. We've established the uh, tentative meeting calendar for 2024. Great. Uh, yeah, public comment. Neil Miller from Cal Atma. Uh, the first meeting that you're going to have in March is after the bills have already gotten out of the, uh, the committee of origin. So that leaves it a little bit late for you to make a comment. If the bill is introduced and it's already gone through committee and you have no input. So the, the bill is rolling along and that you might be opposed to and they're not hearing from you. When When is that day? I'm just going to, we usually don't do back and forth. When is the date that it comes out of committee? So February. So February 16th is the last day for bills to be introduced. And then there's President's Day on the 19th and then spring recess, March 21st. Yeah, and then the legislature reconvenes from spring recess on April 1st. So ultimately with the 8th and 9th uh, board meeting, sorry, is that the date being decided? We're doing 21st and 21st and 22nd. Um, 21st puts it on spring recess. So they would have just left for spring recess. Um, instead of the 14th, 15th, but uh, we still, there's no movement being made uh, until April 1st, and then April 26th is the last day for policy committees to hear and report to fiscal committees. Uh, the concern you mentioned was what again? If there's something that, let's say a bill is introduced and you guys, it, it's not good for the, for the consumer and you guys want to weigh in, or it is good for the consumer, you want to weigh in on it. You're not, you may not have a chance to do that before it gets out. Or if somebody's working on a bill and they want to know your opinion, you know, is this good for the acupuncture board? And we might contact Ben, but he has no option to have a public meeting with the board members to have you and the public members to weigh in on an issue. So if you get a ball rolling on something that you might be against where you might be able to talk. So I just thought an earlier meeting might be in terms of legislative calendar that you'd want to have it a little earlier. That's just my two cents for you. Okay. Um, Maximize your effectiveness. Yeah, thank you. So March, I guess then we would probably want to do what, March 7th and 8th instead of... Well, the last day for each house to pass bills introduced in that house in the odd number year, uh, we're looking at the, the legislative calendar, is January 31st. So in terms of action taking place after that, but before our meeting... The last uh, day for bills to be introduced would be February 16th. So they're just being introduced. Uh, they haven't crossed over to the other house, although I do see Mr. Miller's point. If we wanted to have a position on that, then we would want to be meeting sometime before, I mean, technically before February 16th, but January 3rd, 1st would be possible too. Otherwise, March, everything settled down by that point, and the, the full text is usually uh, more stable. Not that amendments don't happen later on. So do we want, sorry, do we want then to push up that first meeting into January? It's really early. Yeah, I just. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just the it's, it's so early and like things just pop up and die on their own just in that time frame. <laughs> I would also just point out for the benefit of the board that there is a provision in the back of the Keen Act that enables you to meet on 48 hours notice if particularly urgent legislation were to come up that you really do, want yeah, to meet have, Thank you for that. We do have teleconference ability. As long as we're noticing the locations and opening them to the public, yeah. So we we can pivot like that for to address if we need to address the bill. Yeah. yeah, I mean, why don't we just stick with the calendar? I I appreciate Mr. Miller's um, comment. Um, and if if there is something coming out legislatively, I think yeah, we we do have the ability to call a meeting pretty quickly and and do it online if need to be. So okay, well then let's just stick with this. But I appreciate that comment. Um, and we're not going to set actual locate. You will work, staff will work on that. And we don't have to do that now. Okay. Correct. Uh, we, as long as we have the general area, we'll go ahead and manage the reservations. Right. Okay. Well, that is, yeah, I, I think we're okay on this one. Um, online, yeah, we never heard from anyone online regarding the meeting calendar dates. 
This is the moderator. The instructions are on the screen for your reference. If you're logged in and would like to participate, click the outline of a hand, typically bottom center of your WebEx screen. If you're calling in, press star three to raise your virtual hand from your phone. At this time, I see no requests. Thank you very much. We'll move on to item number 14, public comment for items not on the agenda. So we'll stay here in public comments, but we're just on number 14. These any public comment on items that were not on the agenda today. A uh, point of clarification, we are on item 14 in case the WebEx presentation is showing 15. Back two slides. Thank you. Another one. <laughs> Shall I? Check for public comment online. Yes. For those who are logged in, the instructions are on the screen. Again, press that outline of a hand bottom center of your WebEx screen, or as the instructions indicate, you can press on the participants panel, hover the cursor over your name, and click on that outline of a hand that appears. Or if you're calling in, press star three to raise your hand from your phone. No requests coming in. Oh, actually, sorry, I apologize. We have one request. I'm going to set the timer if we can confirm the time limit is two minutes, correct? Correct. Thank you. Pete Barton, I'm going to send a request to unmute your microphone. Is, am I unmuted yet? Yes. Hi, uh, this is Keith Barton in Berkeley, California. Um, just a comment about the WebEx presentation. It seems to be um, much more limited than um, uh, Zoom uh, in terms of visualizing the proceedings as well as being able to share documents. I, I don't know if that's a state requirement that you use WebEx, but um, so far, maybe I'm just not familiar with it, but uh, it doesn't seem to be as versatile uh, or as informative as Zoom. So uh, that's my comment. Thank you. I do appreciate the opportunity to join in these uh, deliberations, by the way. Thank you. This is the moderator. No additional requests. Thank you for that comment, uh, Keith. Yeah, does the state have a? I, I feel like all the committees and board sessions have used this. Correct. So the state can correct me if I'm wrong. I can't speak for other departments, but uh, in our department, WebEx is the standard. Yeah. Teams, as well. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for that. Any other? I don't think there's any discussion on that from the board. We'll move on to future agenda items. Um, uh, let me just comment really quickly because there's a question before how do we get future agenda items future agenda items are put on agendas uh, by the president in consultation with staff and the vice president i i've said before um, i find it helpful there are oftentimes comments from the dais so there's comments from board members about things that we should be um, addressing there's comments from the public i think it is always helpful to uh, not only talk about those at the meetings, but I do think a follow up and I've asked for this a few times and rarely do we get it. Um, I do think in writing via just a simple email uh, or a letter to the executive officer copying uh, me uh, is always really helpful because it articulates in a clear fashion. What exactly are you asking the board to do? And we can then decide is this under our purview? We can have a back and forth discussion, which isn't a. Bagley King open meeting about whether we believe the board should be addressing whatever that item is or whether that's in the purview 
uh, of the legislature uh, or some other body or the profession. So um, just, I guess, to clarify my process, I do appreciate comments during board meetings about future agenda items. I do think sometimes um, here and in the public, pretty generalized comments that I think it's hard to agendize specific uh, items without a little bit more clarification. Oftentimes that takes place with a conversation between the executive officer, me and the vice president. So going forward, if there are items, please obviously bring them up here, email us, um, and we will get them on future agendas. We, as you can see, we're at the end of our agenda right now, um, and it is noon. We have plenty of space and we have plenty of time, and this is a group that likes to tackle issues, and we are not going to shy away from, from tough issues. Uh, we will agendize uh, to the extent that we believe that the board could be uh, tackling something or addressing it, we will. And we have a lot of meetings coming up, and I'm happy to do that. So uh, I do not want people to feel like um, that we are not listening to uh, to the public and, and even to my members. I do think that this, this goes without saying. If there are things that we want to, as a board, uh, address, please, let's, you know, we can... We can open it up here, frankly, and hear a little bit more about uh, and why don't I give that opportunity to the members? If there are future agenda items that you would like to see, why don't we talk about those now? Um, spend a couple minutes. And we also have our strategic planning session tomorrow. We do. Yeah. And, and you know, obviously a lot's going to be brought up tomorrow about essentially establishing future agenda items. I mean, um, but. We can talk a little bit more specifically right now if there are pressing things on members' minds here. I think I was debating should I wait for tomorrow or not. I think maybe there is an issue about the question about the herbs, you know, um, because from the clinical world, and we do see the benefit, but sometimes there are legally legislature involved a penal code, you know, so I'm just thinking, I want to throw that in in the future. It's kind of like always like an elephant sitting there. Uh, so how in the future as a board and uh, appreciate the president has said, I think this board like to tackle things. Um, some kind of the ideas maybe through from tomorrow's, you know, strategic planning and I'd like uh, to throw on the table, there's some kind of herbal discussions. Um, even in the past, you know, I make that example just to let everyone understand, like a mahua, right? A fetching. And this is why it's important you need a licensed seeds educated. And you can't just put on the shelf to sell it, you know, as a you know, weight loss or diuretic, and the next thing, the kidney dysfunction or shut down. And then they remove this herbs off. And we all know that's a, such a critical herbs treating for a certain respiratory disease. So I'm just wanna throw the in, maybe in the future we do have some kind. I know this is acupuncture board, but it's, it is in part of the herbal medicine involved. So I wanna throw on the table, maybe tomorrow we can have a more discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I felt the same way. Like I should, I thought, you know, I should wait until tomorrow. And, but, but since we have the time, so um, for uh, as as I'm going to be working at, on a on a, a, a licensing committee, I'd like to you know bring up some of the issues that uh, some of the attendant attendees uh, 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 you know suggested uh, or the like, uh, I think number number of uh, uh, applicants and uh, uh, licensees every year is, is kind of a, of course, it's been we've been through the the COVID uh, period, it's growing. But I I, I see it as a, a not just the it's COVID. Uh, uh, I see it as a, a profession is kind of a. It's, it's not adapting to the market. And what I mean is, um, I, I remember uh, one time, I think it was like maybe five, six years ago, they did some survey and then 
the, the dis distribution of the uh, uh, of the income of those licensee. A lot of them are in the in the uh, like uh, entry level, uh, you know, and then you don't have much in the mid level. And then at the end you have masters. Not that many, but they are making you know millions of dollars. And this is not healthy, uh, you know, uh, status for a profession. So, uh, what I like to uh, suggest is uh, maybe we can uh, have more of uh, open uh, opinion, uh, you know, discussion on on this uh, because it, this cannot be done in in uh, like I said before. Uh, it has to be coming from profession to. Uh, how how we can uh, uh, develop a uh, educational standard to to compete to all uh, to uh, competitive and uh, align with those market uh, uh, expectations. Like I said, you know, since acupuncture, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Matek is she is working, you know, in in a hospital, but as you, as as you know. If if you see a acupuncturist in the hospital, it's either they have this uh, additional degree or you, you cannot uh, you know, have uh, acupuncturist because they don't pay much, right? The, the the current insurance system. So that's that that's what I'm saying about the uh, market market uh, competency. So. It's not, it's been, the acupuncture has been around like what, 70 years, right? It, it, no, no, I'm sorry, um, 70, 1970s, so uh, about 40, 40, 50 years. It was uh, uh, introduced as a uh, uh, Asian immigrants, uh, you know, uh, heritage, but now it's, it's adapted as a medical, uh, you know, uh, treatment and protocol, but, I see the those uh, uh, education is is not uh, actually uh, what do you call it uh, merged with the main mainstream uh, medical education medical professional uh, schools education. So, if we have that kind of uh, issue to to discuss, maybe we can have we can introduce some other uh, standard or. Uh, you know, we can we can leave the this current minimum competency uh, educational standard as it is, and uh, maybe put additional uh, uh, subspecialty pro, uh, uh, training program. Because, like, for acupuncture uh, like treatment for low back pain, if if it is uh, just the pain control, pain management, it can be done by entry level acupuncturist. Whereas some masters who can just do it with more benefit, more valuable uh, uh, benefits for the patient, but it's, it's, you, you can distinguish, especially in the in reimbursement rate and uh, in, in the system, medical system, or other other people's, uh, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm here also, uh, I don't have the, the, uh, the doctorate degree because I don't see the value of it. Why? Because as long as you do a good job, then they come to you. They don't. They don't see you as a, as a, you know, more more is, uh, you know, distinguished from the the one without a doctorate. I think it's because we need to have a subspecialty, which is we can be recognized by other profession and other public. Uh, maybe uh, align with this market expect. Uh, it, you know, it, uh, it expectancy. I think uh, so. Maybe we are. We maybe hopefully. Yes, or recognize all these master level uh, practitioner versus entry level practitioner. Not just by degree, but so that we can support. Those people to be, uh, you know, served in in a hospital setting, so that it, it makes more feasible for them to have those high level or subspecialties, you know, the uh, 
uh, practitioners. That's, that's my comment. And I, I do see a member of the public here to, I think, probably ask a question or follow up on this. So um, this, this is sort of a conversation. So yeah, sure, go ahead. Hi, my name is Yoon Kim, president of Emperor's College, and really delighted to be here in person to see you all, hardworking members of the board. I just wanted to address um, member Kim's comment about essentially gainful employment and job opportunities for our grads, which is a critical, um, critical area for um, our colleagues in, in the school system. And I want to share some really positive information actually about the VA. As some of you may be aware that the VA initiated what's called a whole health initiative in 2017. So there's now a congressional mandate for the VA to cover acupuncture, Tai Chi, meditation, biofeedback, integrated medicine to our veterans. I mean, this is an incredible, incredible development for our field. We are integrated into the VA system. Um, and, um, you know, this is really quite revolutionary for the, the VA to be offering these services. So Empress College, we have signed an academic affiliation agreement with the Greater Los Angeles VA, the largest VA in the country with serving 80,000 veterans. And as part of our DAOM, our students have the opportunity to have a residency program at the VA, treating veterans with PTSD. Um, and it's just been an incredible experience for our students. And we hope that this can be a pipeline, not just for emperors, but all grads to have experience in the VA and to, to get placed. And we actually have one student who is in the process of being placed at a VA in LA. So this is one area in which is an amazing opportunity for us, um, for our grads and for the schools to prepare our students to work in the integrative setting and to really bring wholeness and wellness and health to these incredible heroes. So um, we want to share that one bit of good news. It's just really incredible, the VA. The largest single payer um, medical system in the country with $250 billion annual budget, and we are being integrated into the system. So I really want to end on this positive note. This is something that all the schools should be forging um, partnerships with, with the VAs. And uh, in our DAO one program, it is, it is part of our education. Thank you so much. If I might, uh, President Herbidi, and just as a friendly reminder to the public and to the members, we are talking about future agenda items. So if you could keep your comments focused on future items, yeah. that'd be great. Thank you. I, I opened it up and Neil, you can you can go ahead. You want we, to take the other members? Yeah, I was going to say, we still, I still do want, I had a feeling this was going to be contingent on Francisco's comments, but do you have anything to, to say? I'm doing this a little unorthodox. I do, but I, I want, you know, I okay. want to honor. Then what, yeah, give us, give us a second here and then, and then come back. Okay. Other members, um, future agenda items or comments on future agenda items. We're not necessarily agendizing anything, but any thoughts uh, on this? Okay. Absolutely. Tomorrow. tomorrow. That's fine. No, and that's perfectly fine. Okay. Mr. Miller, please. And we'll keep it, we'll keep it brief because tomorrow I know you will be here tomorrow and others will. Tomorrow is going to be a, a, you know, a, a full discussion about the stuff too. So go ahead. Thank you. My name is Neil Miller representing Cal Atma. Uh, I, I have probably made more future item agenda recommendations than anyone in the history of the board. Um, I'm not going to bring them all up, but I've reviewed the last, just the last two years. Um, so I'll start with uh, Dr. Chen, who recommended that we have a minimum component of LAC and to discuss that on a future item. What is it? And that this is taken from the minutes that have already been approved. Dr. Mataki mentioned uh, professional entry. Uh, and acupuncture degrees. Dr. Chen said cur uh, curriculum competency, education, uh, and that the board um, listen to the comments that the, have come from the public and that we integrate those into looking at our curriculum competency. Dr. Mataki said that we need to address multiple doctor degrees. Uh, these are things from your board that you've brought up in the last year and a half. Um, at the last meeting, and I brought it up for several years, would be bleeding and wet cupping. Just a brief background. There was an executive director who made a statement that, that these were not part of our scope of practice. 
It's not specifically outlined in statute or regulations, but it is um, part of the curriculum and courses in this are approved for continuing education. And it's a gray area with which we should have an agenda item. Um, Mr. Harvey or Dr. Mataki entertained this once and I made a presentation on it to the board, but there was no follow up. Um, I'd like to talk about um, future agenda item might be lasers. Um, lasers are available over the counter. So I'd like to have a discussion uh, with legal counsel as to whether or not acupuncturists can can utilize these over the counter um, medical devices uh, and, and not be in violation of our of our scope of practice. Um, future agenda items would be uh, education scope, curriculum competency, and California falling behind. We've been a leader since the beginning and we are clearly falling behind even to our neighbors in Nevada and Arizona. And you look at what they've done in terms of their scope, their education, the opportunity for not the, just the profession, but for the, for the consumer. The consumer is missing out because we're a little bit stagnant. Um, I'd like to see a future agenda item addressing law, ethics, and understanding exactly what's being taught in schools to the current LACs and to get some guidance on what's missing. What are those who've been in practice 30, 40 years like myself or 20 years where things have changed? There's a lot of things have changed and we need to figure out a vehicle. So I think that a future agenda item and maybe having some sort of workshop to address those issues. Um, the issue of Asian massage, uh, I'll put it in writing for you, Mr. Harbedian and to our legal department and our new attorney. Uh, it's in our statute. I'd like to know what the heck it is. I cleaned it up today. What the heck is Asian massage? Um, can you tell me what is Tui Na? Tui Na makes more sense than Asian massage. If you Google Tui Na, it'll come up with it. It's a form of manual therapy that's done in Asia. If you Google Asian massage, I guarantee you're new here. Go ahead and Google it and you'll see nothing but half clad naked Asian women. And it's an insult. You all know how I feel how strongly about this. This is something that has to change. And this board could be a real leader in, in really changing that. And this would really help address a lot of the issues where people are using their license illegally, sponsoring uh, Asian massage places and participating in prostitution. It's, it's, it's a big problem. People call our clinics and ask if we do Asian massage. And can we get a you know pretty girl there? It's a problem. We want to we want to stop that issue. I'll wrap it up since you said to be brief. Um, I'd like to do. I'd like to see on a future agenda item uh, an in-depth analysis of the occupational analysis. We did our occupational analysis and we sort of said, here's the occupational analysis. And now we're about a year and a half later, and there's no discussion. There's no real in-depth. Uh, discussion of it and what you're seeing is that um, what is the percentage of people who are falling out of the profession and why that's something that the board can address a lot of it has to do with that curriculum competency and education um, you did a survey in which there were 75 respondents I would like to have at least a discussion as to I think it was 75 uh, I was under 100 respondents and I would like to have a future agenda item about how we could take that same survey and send it out again uh, it just the three, our organization and one other, if we send it just to our people and they'll put their name on it and say, this is how I feel. Because you do, I don't believe that the, that the survey had any statistical relevance being such a small uh, response. And I think that you asked really, really important questions. I think the board did a great job putting together that surgery survey. We just did a terrible job and maybe it was COVID and maybe it was a number of other things, but we didn't get any response. So I'd like to see the board put those two um, issues. Um, and um, Mr. Francisco mentioned something about, you know, our, our um, being relevant or financially relevant, and that's not the purview of the board, but if our education and our curriculum competency was a little bit better, 
then we'd have a much easier time matriculating into uh, systems. Uh, it was brought up about the VA and you know the lack of money. Well, McDonald's workers are making twenty dollars an hour, and no education. So we have education, and it's not enough, and we should be getting paid just as much as some of the other doctors. And the last thing I'd like to see on here, and a very significant part of our education that's missing, has to do with workers' comp. Uh, we are primary care providers under the exact statute of the law, but the letter of the law says that we are physicians for the purposes of work comp, and we have all the rights and responsibilities of what it means to be in work comp. And we've talked about um, chart notes and how delinquent and how deficient chart notes are. You can't participate in work comp unless your chart notes are equal to all the other physicians in work comp. And I think it's a responsibility on the regulating body to see that we're at least educated to participate in a system that affects everybody, everybody who has a job that could be injured on the job. So I think that we really need to take a look and maybe have some sort of mandate in the future towards making sure that the education is up to speed on what it means to be a physician in the workers' comp system and how to work with the other doctors. I think that we'll have far out, a far outreach that will benefit um, the profession and the board in your regulation. If we raise our standards, then your job will be a little bit easier because people have a clear picture on what it is we can and can't do and when to make the referrals and who to make the referrals to. So we could, we could raise up that standard. Empress College is at the top of the level. So when they talk, I go, oh, I'm so proud I went there. And then I look at all the other schools that aren't at that same standard. And, and that's one of the problems is that the standardization of what our minimal level of competence has changed because we have all these doctoral degrees and doctoral things and there isn't a standard anymore. So the consumer is at a real disadvantage knowing it, what it is that we do. I've been in practice almost 40 years, Dr. Kim, and somebody gets out of school now, pays $12,000, and they're a doctor. Are, are we informing the public in an honest way? Does the public have a real understanding of who's best educated, what our title means? I have an OMD degree that they issued for three years. So you literally can call me doctor because I have that but nobody uses it, they outlawed it. But those who have it were still allowed to use it. So we really need to take a, a, a comprehensive look at a lot of these issues. And I'd like to not have them keep going from year to year to year to year. And as long as we have a great chair like you, Mr. Harabini, who understands a, a global thing of this, getting together with Ben and trying to figure out how we could at least next year put some of the stuff on agenda items and really move some things forward. And I think it'll prove for everybody. Thank you for allowing me this short time. Thank you. No, this this is helpful, and um, appreciate you laying that out. Um, not seeing any other comments, so we will just briefly check in. I think okay. No online comments. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, let's adjourn. Uh, we're going to reconvene tomorrow at nine a.m. This is okay. the moderator. If I may interrupt you, I do have an individual who raised their hand online. Just okay. right now, please. And York, I've submit, uh, sent a request to meet your microphone. You're unmuted. I'm going to send another request. Okay, I believe they changed their mind, but I do have another hand. Shad Wong, I'm going to send a request to meet your line. You're Matt unmuted. Wong. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, my name is Chad Wong from Los Angeles. Uh, I just have a quick question. I know that uh, a lot of important issues are being discussed tomorrow, but from the email that I received, there's no remote access. Um, I just want to ask, is there a particular reason? Um, I'm sure a lot of voices want to be heard online. Thank you. Thank you. Is that the end of the comments?
was the end of that comment. Would you like me to move on to the next one? Oh, sure. Oh, okay. Go ahead. And York, I've yes. uh, your microphone is unmuted. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I just want to summarize some of the public comment. Like one regarding the workers come trainer issue. If our school really teach the trainer as the textbook offer, it has the same standard as the orthopedic exam, plus traditional orthopedic participation, examination, and treatment. The issue is our school did not really teach that subject. And most school teach trainer just general relaxation massage. That cannot solve what Neil Miller just mentioned as a workers' count physician. We cannot do the real orthopedic examination as the other stand, professional standard. It's just one of the example. School did not really teach what the title say. Second, regarding our standard, instead of raising the sub subject profession or doctor's program, if our school consider go beyond the income, become the WASC approved school. If the school a WASC approved school, they have the same standard as the all Western university, including the medical school. So if our profession really want to upgrade, we have to look into, number one, do we do what the subject really say? Do we have the same medical standard as the other medical profession? Do we need to run into the WASC standard as our school approved standard? Right now, the ACON will serve the current purpose, but without going to the WASC standard, we our problem will be go on and on. The same issue will be repeat and repeat year to year, even 20 years ago. I just summarized some of the comments I heard for the board to consider. This is not one day, one month, one year plan. This is a, at least a three to five year plan to reach the purpose. That's the, my current comment for what I have heard from the other public. I will come back if I heard more. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you for that. Just a reminder, this is um, future agenda items. I, I do think some of the comments are more um, appropriate for public comment for items not on the agenda, but I do appreciate uh, folks with comments. I'm not trying to um, discourage that, but this is just future agenda items. Any other comments from online? This is the moderator. No, re no further requests. Thank you. Uh, so we will adjourn, and uh, for those who are going to be joining us, 9 a.m. tomorrow in this building. It is not in this room, though. Correct. Okay. okay. Next door. Got it. Uh, and there was a question as to why we didn't do kind of an online teleconference uh, setup. I mean, I think doing a strategic planning session is something that is quite unique. I, I've i never done one kind of with both, you know, a core comp, you know, a core group in a room with an online element. We thought that would be super hard, especially with breakout groups and conversations happening uh, a little less formally. So we have, we chose to do it in person only and, and we think that's going to be more effective and we do appreciate people being here in the public uh, joining us. And for those that can't, you know, it, it is too bad. You can also email uh, any of us with with items you'd like discussed or to be incorporated into the strategic plan. Um, and that is something that you can do. So just to answer that, anything to add to that, Ben? Yep, that's perfect. Okay, thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you.